Here we are, Acts chapter 9. We're going to be looking at the reluctant convert. We're going to look at Saul, Saul of Tarsus, and the conversion, the miraculous event of his conversion that is recorded for us here in the book of Acts in chapter 9. So let's begin reading Acts chapter 9 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 9, and we'll get into our study. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 9, and we're looking at Saul, the reluctant convert. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. The amazing conversion of Saul. As I was preparing this Bible study, I began to think of how many people in Scripture who are only seen one time. And it really is an amazing thing when you think about it. There are people who encountered Jesus Christ... They are touched by him, but either they are unnamed or they're never mentioned again in Scripture. As I was going through Matthew, I began to look at various people that you see one time and then not mentioned again. I, I saw the wise men that are recorded in Matthew chapter 2, very important figures in, in the history of the church, but you only see them in Matthew 2 or the le leper that was cleansed in Matthew chapter 8, the centurion and his servant that are mentioned in Matthew 8. We see Peter's mother-in-law uh, healed by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 8. We see the men of the Gadarenes in Matthew 8. We see them, we see the tremendous miracle that has taken place where they were demonized and, and Jesus releases them from the power of the demons and all, but you never see them again. There's a paralytic that is brought by friends to Jesus Christ. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 9, one of the most amazing stories in Scripture, uh, that these, these men brought a friend who was crippled, he was paralyzed, and because they couldn't get into the house that Jesus was in, they went to the side, walked up the steps, went to the roof, opened up the roof, dropped this man down, not, not physically, but they lowered him down. And uh, we see this amazing story. Jesus forgives him of his sins, and there's a debate related to the forgiveness of sins. But you never see this man again. He's never mentioned in Scripture again. We see uh, Jairus and his daughter in Matthew 9. We see two blind men that Jesus healed again in Matthew 9. We see Jesus healing a man with a withered hand in Matthew 12. Uh, a man who is demon-possessed, blind and mute in Matthew 12. We see a boy who donated his lunch in Matthew chapter 14, enough to feed a multitude of people. But you only see him in that particular event, and you don't see him again. You see a Syrophoenician woman and her daughter, a daughter severely demonized in Matthew 15. Or a father who brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus in Matthew 17. Little is said concerning the mother of James and John. We hear nothing more of a woman caught in the act of adultery recorded in John 8. Nothing of the woman at the well or the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears. You can't help but what, wonder what happened to these people. What happened to them? I was thinking about that. How many people in Scripture you're introduced to, you see an amazing event that took place, and then they disappear. 
you never hear of them again. So many came into contact with the Lord. They have their stories that are recorded in Scripture, and then they disappear. In our last study, we saw an Ethiopian official who was saved. Tremendous conversation between him and Philip. What hinders me from being baptized? You can be baptized if you believe with all your heart. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, and he receives baptism, and then you never see him again. So many come into contact with the Lord. So many get saved, and yet so many faded into history. Throughout history, there have been so many stories of amazing conversions, and some of them have been recorded for us. There was a man by the name of Mal Trotter, and the story of Mal Trotter goes like this. He was an alcoholic who, when his little girl died, stole the shoes she was buried in and sold them so he could get drunk. One night, he staggered into the Pacific Garden Missions in Chicago and was saved. He had a burden for those on Skid Row, so he began a rescue mission in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and went on to found more than 60 missions stretching from Boston to San Francisco. John Newton, John, John Newton worked on slave ships. He captured slaves to sell to the plantations of the South. Eventually, he became the captain of his own ship, and after enduring a horrible storm, was reading a Christian devotion that led to his conversion. Ultimately, he became a leader in evangelical Christianity, along with John and Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, and William Wilberforce. It was Newton who wrote Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. On his headstone, he wrote his own epitaph, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he long labored to destroy. Church history is filled with stories of sinners delivered and transformed by Jesus, but none compare to the conversion of Saul, a man who hated the religion of Jesus Christ. Who was this man named Saul? Let me give you some background as we're about to look at him in his conversion. When you put together Saul's testimony in Scripture, you discover that Saul was a Jewish man, and he was born in a place called Tarsus, in a region called Cilicia, which is southern Turkey. Tarsus was known for its university, and it was equal to the universities of Athens as well as Alexandria. As a Pharisee, he studied in Jerusalem under the great rabbi Gamaliel. It would seem that after he concluded his studies, he went on back to Tarsus and began to live. You see, during that day, during Jesus' day, if there was anyone who could trust in their own religion, their own religious background, their own religious zeal, it would have been Saul. When he writes concerning his uh, testimony, you, you can read it in several places. We're going to see it more than once here in the book of Acts. But when he writes concerning his testimony to the Philippians, he gave a small biographical sketch. In Philippians 3, verses 4 through 6, he said this, he said, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he described himself in a very detailed way. He speaks of being circumcised. What that's speaking of is from birth, he was a child of the covenant. He says, I'm of the stock of Israel, meaning he was not a Gentile convert. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, which is a tribe that remained faithful when all the tribes split. And it's the first king of Israel came out of Benjamin. He says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, meaning that he spoke Hebrew and, can, and retained Jewish customs. He said, I'm a Pharisee. I belong to the strictest religious sect. Concerning zeal for my religion, he said, I'm a persecutor of the church. And concerning righteousness found in the law, I have fanatically kept it. 
And so he spoke concerning his background in that way. And all of that would seem to be a great advantage to anyone who is religiously inclined. And yet he spoke and continued to say in Philippians 3, by, in verses 7 through 9, he continued by saying, But what things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. This is a man who had tremendous advantages. He was a scholar of scholars, an intellectual of intellectuals, highly trained, highly religious, highly devoted. But none of those things, none of those advantages brought him closer to God. Someone said, ultimately, they were excess baggage on a sinking ship. He counted them loss because the true treasure, he says, was in knowing Jesus Christ and the peace that comes through grace. What we're looking at is the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Now, he was introduced to us first in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. There, you see him guarding the clothing of those who stoned Stephen to death. In Acts 8, verse 1, it says that Saul was consenting to his death. He was pleased with and in agreement with the death of Stephen. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So persecution had broken out against the Christians. And Saul was inflamed by it, and Saul joined in it. It says in verse 1 of chapter 9, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And so he lived, as it were, in an atmosphere of threats and slaughter. This was the very air that he breathed. And his hatred didn't cool. After Stephen's death, he only desired more devastation. It, it may have grown even worse after the Samaritans had been preached to. You see, he was consumed with hatred for Christians. And not simply for the leaders of the church. He said he hated them, hated them all. He was an equal opportunity hater. That was Saul. In Galatians 1.13, he said, You have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. It wasn't just the leaders that Saul hated. It was every person who called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he does is he obtains letters of authority uh, from the chief priests to destroy those who are members of the way. Now, that is what Christians were originally referred to as. We were those of the way. Um, this is because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so later on, we will be referred to as Christians, and I'll share with you at that point when we get there, that the word Christian speaks literally of a, a little Christ. That's what its translation is, little Christ. And the word Christian was not initially given as, as a, a badge of honor in any, in any way. It was actually uh, used in order to, to, uh, to denigrate Christians. It was a, a word that was used to put people down. It wasn't something that was used to give them any kind of uh, admiration or any kind of glory at all. But they were originally, we were originally members of what was called the way. And he was breathing threatening, threatenings against the members of the way. It says in verse 2, he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so it was his desire to take men or women believers and bring them back to the city of Jerusalem. And there they were going to be tried and punished. Later on in chapter 22 of Acts, Verses 4 and 5, he said, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. That was what I intended to do. In chapter 26 of Acts, verses 9 through 11, he said, Indeed, 
I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. I hated them so much that I, I pursued them wherever they may have been. This was Saul. He hated Christians. But somebody asks the question, why would a devoutly religious man be so intent on wiping out Christians? Why did he hate Christianity so much? It would seem, in its most basic form, that he considered the gospel teaching to be heresy and those who embraced this message to be heretics. It says in Deuteronomy 18.20, the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And so it would seem he was applying his understanding to the Old Testament as it pertained to blasphemy. And he believed that those who embraced Christ as Lord and Messiah were people who were heretics and therefore deserved to be put to death. And so he not only pursued them within the framework of Israel, but when he heard that they were someplace else, even as far as Syria, Damascus, Syria, he would go there in order to take them, put them in chains, bring them back, and try them as heretics. Damascus is where he's speaking about here in verse 2 when he says that he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. Damascus is a very ancient city in Syria. It has a very long history. It's mentioned numerous times in Scripture. And during this day, it had a very large Jewish population. And it was increasing uh, because of Christian refugees who were fleeing the persecution. And Saul knew there were Christians seeking safety there. So he went to get them. It would have taken him to go from Jerusalem to go north and cut off to the east and to move into Syria. It would have taken him as he walked probably seven to eight days as he would have made that journey. And so this is what he's doing. He's going up in order to arrest, put in chains, and bring back these Christians to try them. Now in verse 3 it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Now when you look at this, you're seeing God intervening, and where, where Saul was on his way to arrest Christians, you're actually seeing God arrest Saul. And he's intervening and interrupting Saul in his plans. Now, when you look at the Ethiopian eunuch that we just looked at last time we were together, it was interesting to note that he had an obvious interest, a curiosity, a spiritual hunger, and uh, God placed a man named Philip uh, together with him so that Philip could, could feed that spiritual hunger with the answer as to who the person in Isaiah 53 was and presented Christ to him. And we saw that last time we were together. But this man obviously had a spiritual hunger. There he is. He had gone to the city of Jerusalem. He is returning. He's reading the Bible out loud. He obviously has a very spiritual mind. And he had evidence that he was curious and even hungry. But Saul doesn't evidence this at all. As a matter of fact, it's obvious that he is very content in his own religion. He was a man who was zealously pleasing God. At least he was seeking to please him, but his pursuit was in the wrong direction. You know, he speaks concerning his Jewish, his Jewish brethren when he writes to the Romans. He says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. They have an ignorance that drives them. He could say that because he had the same thing. They have a zeal. They want to do the things that they think are right, but they haven't been instructed properly. And so he has this zeal also. But what happens is it's for the wrong thing. So God chooses to reveal himself to him. And this is interesting how he does it, because I want you to notice how it speaks concerning verse 3, a light that shone around him from heaven, an incredibly bright light. 
a brilliant light, a light that is brighter than the sunlight occurs. When he's speaking to Agrippa in Acts 26, 13, he said to him, at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. What he was seeing was Jesus in this glorious, brilliant light. How do we know that? Because in chapter 9, verse 17, it reads, Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So this, this Shekinah glory, this brilliance, uh, was actually Jesus revealing himself to him. In Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment. And what happens when this light shines around him? Well, it says in verse 4, he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Over the years, there have been some outlandish things said in the name of Jesus, and you can see these outlandish things sometimes even to this day. All you need to do is turn on some programs on TV that are purported to be Christian, and you hear the most amazingly odd things. And I remember hearing, a, a com hearing of a conversation between John MacArthur and a man who claims to have visitations from Jesus. And this is a true story, what I'm telling you, true conversation. And the man said to John MacArthur, a well-known Bible teacher some of you are familiar with, said, John, he goes, I want to tell you something. Every morning... When I'm shaving, Jesus comes into my, uh, the area I'm shaving and stands next to me and we have a conversation. Do you believe that? And John says, it doesn't matter what I believe. What scares me is I think you do believe that. <laughs> You know, I have to be careful here because this is one of my pet peeves. When I read the scriptures, I see that when even, when even angels appear before people, even angelic visitations, the people have a tendency of falling down before these glorious creatures, and they're creatures. And when you read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 14, it says that angels are actually ministering spirits who are sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. And in other words, an angel is not greater than, than, than a believer in Christ. They're actually sent by God to serve believers in Jesus Christ. And yet you'll see when there's an angelic visitation, often the, the one who has that visitation in Scripture is, is afraid, may even bow down. They, they don't know what to do. And yet you hear so many people, and I've heard many, and perhaps some of you haven't heard this. Maybe they've stopped doing this. I don't think so. You'll hear these interesting stories that are just outlandish lies where people are saying that, that they encounter God or an angel and have conversations. They have, you know, buddy conversations with Jesus. Are you kidding me? I, when, when, when Moses received the law on Mount Sinai and there was, there was all of this noise and light and and, and there was a fear. The people at, below the mountain, they said, we don't want to go up there. You go up there lest we die. I mean, that's what happens when you really do encounter holiness. When you, if, if God breaks in somehow in your life, you're not casual. You don't keep chewing your gum and smacking your lips or you're talking to him. I promise you. I promise you. You're on your face instantly. It's God himself. Think of that. And next time you hear somebody give a casual story how Jesus and they have this cool, you know, coffee and conversation every morning, that isn't what the scripture teaches. When Jesus made his appearance to Saul, I want you to see it with me. Verse 4, he fell to the ground. He was on the ground. And... There's this voice that hears, and it says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
You see, God initiates this conversation with Saul. Again, Saul wasn't seeking him, but he was seeking Saul. In John 6, 44, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. So he fell to the ground. He hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now that must have confused him for a moment because he didn't think he was persecuting. He thought he was helping. He actually thought that the zeal that he had for the Lord had consumed him. But the fact is, in his persecution of Christians, he was in opposition to Jesus himself. And I want you to notice something. In persecuting those who love Jesus, he was in fact attacking Jesus. And so, when the question is asked, why are you persecuting me, verse 5, he said, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. He recognizes, even in his question, notice he said, who are you, Lord? In this question, he recognizes he's speaking to one who is greater than himself, and that must have overwhelmed him. And Jesus, he clearly states, I am the one that you're persecuting. You see, he could be saying, I am the one that Stephen spoke about that resulted in his death. I'm the one that you have been forcing people to blaspheme. I'm the one that you have hated and that you have resisted. And I am now the one that you are on your face before. Who am I? I'm the one you've been persecuting. And when he did this, remember something that Paul later on would write. He said, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He learned that himself when Jesus confronted him. And there he is before the Lord bowing. And it says in verse 6, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said to him, arise and go into the city. You'll be told what you must do. What do you want me to do? So here you go, very basic. Jesus gave him a very simple command. Get up, go to Damascus, and wait. Let me give you a biblical principle that I've given numerous times. I'll repeat it. It's so basic, but it's really necessary for us to get it. If you can get this, God can use you. If you get it, he can, he can use you. And it's a real simple principle. Great works begin with small obedience to small things. Great works begins with obedience in small things. Obedience in small things. All right. I've got a couple of illustrations here. I'm real curious, and I don't want, I'm not putting you on the spot. No, we're not having a spot quiz. But I would like to know, how many of you have ever heard the name Edward Kimball? Raise your hand. I'd like to know. Some of you have. Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball. Okay, let me read to you about Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was a shoe salesman. And one day he shared the gospel with a young man who became a great evangelist. Nobody remembers Kimball, but perhaps you've heard of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody. How did D.L. Moody get saved? A Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball was concerned about the members of his class, whether they knew Christ. And he went to where D.L. Moody was working, sought him out, asked him the condition of his soul, led him to faith in Christ. Obedience in small things leads to greatness in the kingdom of God. Now, Moody held a campaign in the British Isles, 
and a young man came to Jesus by the name of F.B. Meyer. Meyer became a pastor and author in England. In one of his services, a young man named Wilbur Chapman, who got, was, a, was a young man named Wilbur Chapman, who got saved and led a young American to the Lord named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday went on to be an evangelist, and he led an outreach to businessmen, including a young man named Mordecai Ham. How many of you have ever heard of Mordecai Ham? probably know his brother, Billy Eggs, right? They are always together. But anyway, I'm sorry. I don't know why. Don't ask me. <laughs> Mordecai Ham. Very few of you have heard of him. Just a couple of hands went up. Well, at, uh, at one of Mordecai Ham's meetings was a young man from South Carolina who gave his life to Christ. His name was Billy Graham. We know of the fruit of the ministry very often, don't we? But we don't know how that happened. God has a way of blessing our efforts, small efforts. And greatness will always begin with simple obedience. I am telling you, there are people who want to be used by the Lord but they don't realize that there are steps involved where God will give to you something. You're faithful in that. You move to something else. You're faithful in that on and on and on until you're in a place where the Lord uses you in the way that you always wanted to be used but weren't prepared. Um, back in around 76, 1976, I was going to right in that area. I was going to Calvary Chapel of Downey. Marie and I were. And Jeff Johnson had his first pastor's class that he, he had. When Calvary Chapel Downey began, Jeff used to meet in a little garage. It looked like a garage. And I drove by one time with a friend of mine who was a youth pastor at Downey First Baptist Church. And this youth pastor, John, and I were good friends, and we were driving by, and we drove by this, it was a garage, and on the side, with spray paint, it said, New Life Ministry. <laughs> with this spray, somebody sprayed it, you know, New Life Ministry. And as we drove by, my friend John turns to me and says, we think that's a cult. We think that's a cult. It was Jeff Johnson, and that's where he was doing his ministry at the beginning in this little garage. And so over a couple of years, Marie and I eventually started going to his church. And uh, Jeff actually dedicated my daughter Corinne to the Lord. Uh, that's why I had so many problems with her. It's because, <laughs> it's because of Jeff. I've told him that many times. Well, Jeff had his first pastor's class. People who want to be in ministry. He took applications from members of his church at that time. I was going there on Sunday mornings. So I went to his first, I applied and was accepted and went to his first pastor's class that he had there at Calvary Chapel of Downey. And so it was a class that went for six weeks and Jeff gave us his phone number and said, listen, if you ever need to contact me once the class was over, if you need to contact me, give me a call. So the class was over on a Monday and I called him on Tuesday because I wanted to go on staff. I wanted to be a pastor. I'd already been teaching three and a half years. I was going to Biola. You know, I was a you know, Bible student, this and that. I was uh, ministering to people in cults and things. I already was trying to minister. And, uh, and I, you know, so I called him. I still remember our conversation. And I said to Jeff, I said, listen, Jeff, you said we could call you if we'd like to. He goes, yeah. I said, well, I'm calling you. You know, and what I was hoping that he was going to do, I was hoping that he was going to sense the anointing of the Spirit in my voice over the phone. <laughs> I really did. And I was thinking, I used to think if you sat in the front row there that the pastor would see a holy glow on you and know you're anointed and put you in ministry. I really did. I mean, that was, that was me. So I'm thinking I, I'll call and, 
and certainly I finish your class and you'll give me, you know, you want coffee with me, we'll get to know each other and you've got a key to an office in your pocket that you're going to hand to me and I'm going to come on staff. I really wanted to serve the Lord. And so I call him up and I said, Jeff, and I, I said, as part of your class and, and I'd like to know, you know, what your advice would be because I sense a call into ministry and I really am waiting for him to say, you know, Dave, you know, I, I, I sense it too. Come on down. Kind of like, you know, come on down. But he didn't. <laughs> he said, you know, he goes, my recommendation to you would be this. Do what you're doing and do it faithfully. And as the Lord sees your faithfulness in the small things, he opens doors for other things. I hung up, said, well, bless you, thank you, Jeff. I hung up, I was so angry. I thought, <laughs> you know, you anti-Christ, you can't even see. I was, I was so, and, a, and about a year and a half later, it took a year and a half later, is when I, was, when I was moved into ministry in another church, in another Calvary, and that I got ordained in that church after being appointed to a board and doing Bible studies. And in 1979, I got ordained as a Calvary Chapel pastor. But it was a year and a half or so after I had made that phone call and heard that advice, which was be faithful in the small things, be obedient in the small, and God will give you something to do that appears to be even larger. Actually, in the sight of God, there's nothing small and nothing great. It's all blessed by him in one form or another. And so if you're faithful in that which is least, you'll be faithful in that which is much. So remember that always. Great works begin with obedience to the small things. And so he's saying to him, what must I do? And the answer is, go into the city. You'll be told what you must do. And so it's a small thing, just be obedient. So verse 7 the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Now they heard the voice, but they could not understand because the words were not intended for them. They were for Saul. You see, in Acts 22, 9, he said, My companions saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. They, they, they could see what something was going on, but they, it, that was not something that was intended for their ears. It was something for the ears of Saul. You see, God's words are not understood by those who have no interest in him. I've said this before, but in matters of salvation, the same message that results in salvation for one person, it's the same message that pushes somebody out of the door and say, I never want to hear that again. The same sun that melts wax hardens clay. The same message that spoke to somebody's heart and they said, my sins have been revealed. My way is lost. I need God. Forgive me a sinner. That same message caused somebody else to get angry and to walk out of the door and to say, I'll never go back to a place like that. It's so harsh, it's so unloving, it's so judgmental, it's, it's just, they're self-righteous, they're all Pharisees. Same message. And so sometimes the Lord is speaking in a way to one person that another person simply doesn't get. He just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. In John chapter 12, verses 27 through 29, Jesus was speaking in this passage, and he said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glor glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said, it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. The voice was to the Lord and those who could hear. And I'm telling you, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. There are times when the Bible is being divided, when you're listening to the study, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God speaking directly to you. You know it. You know it. You know it. It's like God's mighty hand is on your chest and holding you in that seat. You're not going anywhere until I finish telling you this. You ever have that? I have. 
I have. Yeah, that pressure of the spirit. And you're, I'm going to get out of here. And the Lord says, you're not going anywhere. You're, you're staying right there. The Lord has a, um, a way of speaking a word to you that is a fit word in a proper season. And Bible studies like this, there are times when people, if they don't wait for the end, God may have had something he wanted to say at the end, but they got up and walked out in the middle and they never heard that word. They never heard that word because they weren't willing to listen to the conclusion. They weren't willing to listen to the final word, what he had to say. That's why you sit and that's why you listen. And that's why you say, God, speak to me. I want to hear you today. I, I didn't waste my time coming here. I know you have something for me. What is it that you want me to know today? And you listen with a heart to obey. And some people say it thundered. Some of you say, well, it sounds like an angel speaking. But others will say, no, he has glorified it. His name and will glorify it again. No, I heard what God is saying in this particular case. In this case here, they didn't understand what was being said, but Saul heard it very clearly. It says in verse 8, Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. What happens is he went temporarily blind. He had to actually be led by the hand into the city. <laughs> Now think about that, because that was a different way of entering the city than he planned. He didn't plan on entering the city being led by the hand as a blind man. He planned to enter into the city as a man breathing out threatenings, breathing out slaughter, a man greatly feared because of his authority and his intellect. Incidentally, when you look at descriptions, ancient descriptions of Saul, he, was, he is never described as being a big, strong, powerful man, good-looking guy. He, he is spoken of in, in other ways. He is spoken of as being uh, a small man, a frail-looking man, an over-large head with eyes that were bulging and infected. And he wasn't a... Well, you'll read, he, he even makes mention of how he was spoken of in, in 2 Corinthians. He says they say that his, his words are weighty, and, but his, 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 his bodily presence is weak. You know, they speak concerning him that way. When you read the book of 2 Corinthians, you will see that he answers some 21 or 22 charges that were leveled against him. And one of those were his description of who he is. Oh, he preaches with strong words but he's a weakling himself. So this was a man who had authority that he wielded, may have had somewhat of a small man's kind of complex, but I got power. And he was coming in, and he was going to come into Damascus, and they were trembling because this, this man was coming in who had authority to take them bound in chains, break them and bring them back to Jerusalem, try them as heretics, and witness to their death. They knew it. He intended to come into the city with an attitude, with an arrogant, pugnacious mentality to take these heretics and show them the justice of God. He expected to come in as the master. He came in like a little boy being led by the hand and the humility from the very beginning of how the Lord began to deal with him is demonstrated in that way. God crushed Saul. But here's a spiritual lesson for you. God crushed him, and he arose from the ashes as the greatest man God ever used. Don't forget that. When God breaks, he recreates. When he smashes, you come out greater. That's how it works. Do not get upset at God when he breaks you. Because those whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. If you want to be used by God, please hear me. I hope you want to be used by God. Don't be afraid to be broken. Don't be afraid to be broken. Because the most valuable vessel in the hand of God will always be the broken one. Do you want to reach people? You will never reach people 
if you have arrogance and pride. They will hate you. But if you come to them with humility and love, they will listen. Paul had these, this incredible, brilliant mind. One of my secular professors said that he was the premier intellect of his day. That the Apostle Paul, read his writings and you'll see what I mean. You know, I have to pour over his writings with commentators and prayer and God help me. What is he talking about? Now for him, it's just a letter. He's just writing a letter. For me, I'm saying, what do you talk? What do you mean by that? How could you? You know, Peter later on in his writing said his, his words are weighty and hard to understand. And, that, and that's a fact. But this man was broken. This was a man who was crushed by God. This was a man who was breathing out threatenings. And God said, no. You came to arrest my children. You were actually persecuting me. I'm not going to allow that. And by the way, your plans for yourself, I've got greater ones. And I'm crushing you. And I will crush you. But once I'm through crushing you, out of those ashes will arise the greatest man that ever walked the face of the earth outside of Jesus. Paul. Paul the Apostle. From the one who was Saul, the mighty one, he became Paul, the small one. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. Do you desire great things? Desire them not, God said through the prophet to Baruch. Desire them not. You let God do what God wants to do and watch what he'll do with a vessel that's broken. You watch what he'll do. Because again, the most valuable vessel in the hand of God will always be the one that's been broken by God. Always always will be the one broken by God. Peter thought that he loved Jesus more than others. He even boasted that he did. But when it came down to it, Jesus said, do you really love me? And I'm telling you, you're going to deny me this night three times. No. No. Satan has desired you that he may sift you, even as wheat is sifted. But I've prayed for you. And after you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Lord, I would die for you. Will you really? You're going to deny me. No, I won't. Yes, you will. But it's not a surprise to me. Because see, the process that I'm working with you is I'm going to take your ashes and I'm going to turn them into beauty. You're going to see that. Listen, one of the things, and I'll close with this, one of the things that I see today in the church is there's a desire for the crown, but very few people are willing to bear a cross. We want to rule, but we don't want to be ruled. We want to have people follow orders, but we don't follow even the simplest ones that God gives to us. We want to be great, but we don't realize that greatness comes from being the servant of all. We don't understand that. And so what we want is we want fame and fortune. Fame and fortune all fades. The only thing that lasts is what you've laid ahead of yourself in heaven. It's the only thing that lasts. Everything you have on the face of the earth is used up, wasted. It's not that we can't have these things, but sometimes these things have us. And it keeps us from being used by God. Saul really had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. So God said, I'm going to use this man. If you read, and you will with me, if you stick it, stick it out with me here in Acts, you're going to see that this man who was breathing out threatenings and went anywhere, wherever he heard these people believed in Jesus, he became the one who said, I'm going to go where they've never heard his name. I'm going to take this gospel through the world. From the one who chased them to where they were, to the one who took this message to where Jesus had yet to be named. And that came because he was on his way to Damascus as a big bad wolf. And he ended up one of Jesus' sheep. That's how it works.